Friends, welcome again for another edition of Tiffin Cast. I am here with Paul Jarvis, who is based out of Victoria, Canada. And Paul's a, a web designer, uh, an author, and uh, from my perspective, at least, uh, he's also a vegan, which makes him a very cool guy. Paul, thank you for joining us and, and for making this time. Um, my we're, pleasure. We're talking, we're really set to talk about one of your books, but I have to tell you, I've read your other books and they've all had a very similar tone to them, which is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you like it is, and it's my perspective, and it is what it is. Um, when you set out to write everything I know, which I think also by, by title, it just sort of seems like this is it, man, everything I know, you know, exactly. It's not going to be that long of a book. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is, what were you, what, what, what were your thoughts on, on creating this book for, for people, for your audience? Yeah. So for, for everything I know, I was really, I came at, well, first of all, I wrote the book without really knowing what I was going to write at first, which is fairly new. The last two books I did, I had kind of, this is exactly what I'm going to write. And then I wrote it for this. I had a general idea of what I wanted to say. And then I kind of struggled with trying to fit it into a framework. And then I eventually settled on, I'm just going to write everything. And then I can, I can edit it back from there, or I can make it make sense after I write it. Sure. And so, and a lot of writers get kind of tri tripped up at the beginning with the the staring at a blank page and being like, uh oh. So I just kind of wrote, it was a horror, like the first draft was horrible. It didn't make any sense to anybody but me, but I got it all down. And that was the main part. And that became the, the, the setting stone for moving forward. Um, everything I know, uh, and, and you know, it, it is a rather broad topic, um, but you. In, in the sample you sent me, uh, which uh, I, I, hopefully it's okay for me to read from, um, sure. you say, my goal for this book is to illustrate the potential you've got inside of you right now to do something unique and innovative. Right? So that's, yeah. that's the, the goal of the whole book. Yeah, it's kind of, it's in a broad sense, it's all encompassing. In a specific sense, it really relates to working for yourself specifically in a creative field just because that's what I know that's what I've done for two decades as well as dealing with obstacles and stumbling blocks blocks that many creatives kind of find on their journey and on their path and working with clients and doing side projects and really finding whatever meaning that you derive from the work that you do and figuring out what that is and how to do more work that leads to more meaning and that's kind of it it's kind of broad sense and philosophical, but the, the way that it's written, hopefully, is really these are the, some concrete things that I've learned or that uh, people that I know have learned. Excellent. Um, people often struggle with the notion of the, or the belief that they have something unique and un innovative inside of them uh, that they want to share or serve the clients with. What do you mm -hmm. suggest people must do first to let go of this fear? Well, I think it's... It's kind of ingrained in us from everything from going to school. Like in school, you're kind of taught that if you're too different or too unique or you don't do the work the way you're very, the way it's specifically supposed to be done, then you might not get a good grade. And then you're ranked in terms of how well you can comply to this notion of compliance. So when you get it into the real world, and I mean, if you're working at a big company or a corporation, you get, it kind of falls to the same thing you get ranked and judged based on how well you can do certain tasks that fall within the norms of the company and the revenue and the company culture even. Mm -hmm. So when you're working for yourself, I think we're so, we get that so ingrained in our minds from school and, and real jobs and that sort of thing that when we're working for ourselves, we think that we kind of have to do the same thing. And we don't. We can be our own bosses. We can have quarterly happiness reports instead of like quarterly shareholder reports, we cannot be focused entirely on the bottom line. So I think that's, and that's where uniqueness comes. You don't have to be like a crazy person with like a mohawk and purple hair to be like unique or weird or different. You can find where you find the most value in the work that you do. And that can be different from everybody else, but that can be really what sets you apart and what, allows you to make a business that you don't hate, which is kind of important. 
Because if you're working for somebody else and you hate the job, you can blame your boss, you can blame the company. When you're working for yourself, if you don't like your job, it's kind of your fault. And yes. That's, that's not, yeah, it's not good. Right. So, right. But you have the ability to change that because you're the boss. Absolutely. Um, as somebody said, you know, are you the CEO of your own company? Which is, I mean, it was just kind of interesting to, to, to approach your business in that way where you're, yeah. you're in charge of everything where – Including your happiness is is so paramount and you know propelling you forward. So uh, let's come back to that in a bit. But um, one of the other questions I had when in, after I read your uh, your first part of your book it was uh, this idea of risk versus reward, and we hear that a lot. Uh, and taking risks, uh, we're told, can lead to great things. You know, uh, and you know, I, I, I've seen that in my own business as a photographer, and it, and it does work. You, know, you, you do something innovative with lighting, for instance, and then the, the client goes nuts, and, and they, they love it. And, they, and then, of course, you've got to keep innovating to keep you know, satisfying other clients, which is part of being creative. Mm -hmm. um, what, at what point, though, is that risk uh, to, to be calculated versus sort of ignored? So for something like that, and I mean, I'm pretty like, I love to experiment with ideas and things. And when I'm working, like, because I do web design, I can try new layouts or new designs for clients that I do. And I try to, when I'm factoring in, if something, if the risk is worth the reward, I try to take as little steps as possible. So if it is, that's great. And I can keep incrementally building on that. And if it's not, then I can kind of circle back and try something different. But the, the key point to that is doing, doing things like that, doing these experiments and doing these risks in the smallest step as possible, and then building on it if it works and circling back and going elsewhere if it doesn't. So the smallest possible innovations tend to, and then you incrementally build, tend to have the, the best net result I've found. That's that's wonderful advice. I mean, it's uh, it was one of my other questions to you. Um, when you do serve clients, um, you are serving them with the idea that you're providing them with some meaning, right? That meaning that that you provide them actually is called value, correct? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and how do you recommend one aspect of that meets the other, where it's a wonderful exchange, where something you're doing is meaningful to you and then your clients are looking at that and going yes that meets my expectations that's that's exactly what I would love for for m my family to have for instance if I'm a photographer yeah. working working with a family as a photog family photographer it, it's in the way that I I guess project my my business will will so either convince or you know well one way or the other convince the the, the family to either hire me or not hire me. So my question to you is how, how do you, how do you make that work? You know? Yeah, it's tough. It's hard and it's a, it's a long road and it's not a, uh, when you're starting out, especially it's hard to say no to projects and the clients that might not be a good fit where you might not find any meaning from it. Everybody got rent and mouths to feed and that sort of thing. So in the beginning, you might have to say yes to some of these projects that they're not that fun, mm -hmm. but if you do a good job on them, then it might lead to more work. So the way that I kind of built my business around having work that I find really meaningful and working with the right clients who are the right clients to me, they might be the wrong clients to somebody else, Right. is trying to find after the initial like, okay, I have, I paid rent. I have food to eat. So past that, then really trying to find those clients that are the right clients for you. And that involves, it's almost like interviewing them, like trying to find out what their goals are and that sort of thing. And that, that it doesn't happen overnight. Like I, I had the first, like I started working in pro sports, doing websites for pro sports, which seems really cool, except they hate pro sports. So that's the right job for somebody else, but not for me. But that led to other opportunities because I couldn't say no to that because it was right at the beginning of my career, that it led to other opportunities that I could say yes to. And the more work that I did, the more I could be kind of picky with the clients. And 
suggest maybe they can work with this other designer or this other designer and then leave myself open to work with clients that I do want to work with. And then once you start working with those clients, and I don't know if it's in the excerpt that I sent you, but in the book I talk about how the more work you do that you like and that you find meaning and that are the right clients for you, the more work you will get. Mm -hmm. Like attracts like in that way. So if you have work that you really love, like I, I love working with authors. So the more authors I have in my portfolio, the more other authors see hey, this guy does work with these authors. So these people that I work with really attract other clients like that. So I've kind of built myself into this amazing niche now where it's work that I love, it's clients that are, that are absolutely fantastic, and that I just keep getting more and more of the same because that, that's the work I do. So I've said no to some projects to be able to get those projects. But yeah, at the beginning, you can't do that. And sometimes if you have bills to pay you you got to say yes to projects and that's just and that's the way that it kind of works sometimes but when it doesn't then having the ability to choose is is an amazing thing um one thing that i was amazed to read in in your uh in your uh website is that uh you initially or you probably do now have a website with very little information about what you do i mean they know people know you as a web designer you know, obviously, yeah. obviously because of all the clients and you've got your clients talking about you, which, which sort of happened organically almost, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you're going to talk about that a little bit more in your book. Um, but at what point though, did your first client come to you and say, this is, this is a good match. See what I'm trying to get at? Was was it in your messaging in some way, whether it's, uh, you know, a chat over a beer or was it a, an email that you sent somebody or was it on your website that says, I would like to work with these kinds of clients and that's how you attracted your first right client? Yeah. So, I mean, with that, it, I didn't realize I had my first right client until I finished working with them. Because they, I didn't know in the beginning, like I had no idea. But again, I, I started the more work that I took on from lots of different markets and lots of different niches. I was just trying a project here, a project there, a project there. And then as soon as I started to like one type of client and one type of job more than the other, it kind of ran in that direction. And the biggest thing for me for really figuring that out, because I don't have like on my website, I think I have a couple pages, but I write a lot of articles. And all of my articles, pretty much like a line drawn in the sand, you either really agree with me or think I'm full of shit. So <laughs> my, the p potential clients, if they really disagree with me, they're not going to contact me to see if I want to do a job with them. Whereas the clients that are like, okay, I really like what Paul has to say about design or SEO or whatever, then those people are kind of on the same wavelength as I am in terms of the work that I want to do, at, which is the work that they want to have done for them. Uh -huh. So really communicating with the potential clients that you have in writing or videos or interviews or podcasts or whatever, if you can get your expertise out there past just this is my portfolio, then that really builds a, a good like divining rod basically to figure out for clients to figure out okay is this person worth working with is this the person that I want to work with or not and then those tend to be the right kind of clients that's a, a fa again fantastic advice um, I, and I'm thinking uh, for my audience which uh, mostly are photographers I think they need to hear that so much more often because I think if you say there's this tendency to go out and buy the same templates and post the same types of images almost yeah. on websites and, and trying to attract the same clients. And so you're, you're essentially fighting for the same clients while almost denying yourself the idea that you have your own uh, sense of values and sen sensibilities in terms of how you produce the, uh, the work for your, for your right client. Right? Exactly. And if I was a photographer, I would be more focused on promoting the photographs that I absolutely love as opposed to the photographs that I think other clients or other photographers might think, okay, this, this is really good. If I had a shot from a shoot that I was working with with a client that I just absolutely loved and it's like, I want more of this, 
that would be front and center in my portfolio. Like even if it was nothing to do with where the industry is or what types of like if I was a wedding photographer, this doesn't look like a wedding photograph, but who cares? Like I know I have a photographer friend that posts only weird and unique and different wedding photographs and she does so she has a magazine now because she's focused on she's focused so heavily on a market that didn't seem to really have an audience but it did it's just people photographers weren't posting about that or posting those types of shots because they thought uh maybe i won't be able to sell sell work like that and like i said in the beginning it's a risk but if you take a small risk with a few shots at first or a few portfolio pieces at first and see if it nets those types of clients then then it's kind of worth it i think from what i'm hearing you paul from you paul i i feel like there's got to be a certain level of confidence a certain level of irreverence, right? Yeah. To say, listen, I'm going to just do this because this is what moves me, you know, moves inside of me. Mm -hmm. And at that point, whoever is attracted to it is attracted to it and will pay whatever they feel like they should pay, you know. Um, this is a very interesting, interesting, uh, <laughs> interesting conversation, I feel. Um how much of this do you get into in, the, in your book? Because I think that should be really the focus of this chat because I really wanted to ask you more about your book. Sure. And I mean, a, a, lot, of it is, a lot of it is that. And I mean, the confidence comes less from ego and more from knowing what, uh, what makes me happy in terms of the, the type of work that I do. So I'm confident in my own happiness as opposed to confidence in the ego that I have Mm -hmm. for the expertise that I have. Like, obviously, I feel I have expertise in, in the, the web design work that I do. But it also more, the confidence more comes from the fact that I know the kind of people I want to work with. So the more I put out there who I am and how I feel about that kind of stuff, the more I will attract those types of clients. And it, it is a little bit on the philosophical side for like full on like I, I'm a web designer. I'm not a philosopher or anything, but it does come a little bit from the, I know where I find meaning and I know where I find happiness for that type of work. So I know what I want to put out there to, to make that happen. Paul, thank you so much for your time. I know, no uh, I know it's been a, it's been a wonderful chat and I look forward to continuing our conversation after the book comes out. The book, um, you're launching really through a Kickstarter program, um, yes. which is also a rather unique way of, of publishing a book. Um, you know, I've had people, you know, work on documentaries and, and um, you know, uh, other projects where, you know, certainly crowdfunding is an idea that, you know, makes sense. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, why, why Kickstarter for a book? Because I wanted to, and I've talked to a few publishers that were interested, based on the, the previous two books that I did, I had a, a bit of interest from publishers saying, like, we can, we can work with you, are at a level where we can work with you. But I just find the publishing industry and publishing a book through a traditional publisher makes a ton of sense for some people. And for some projects, sometimes it doesn't. But for me, I really wanted to see if my book could live or die based on my direct audience communicating directly with them instead of going to a publisher who thinks they know my audience but might not so I wanted to kickstart it because I want to print a really like gorgeous hardcover version of it and I don't want to print 500 or 1000 copies and just have it like sit in the corner over there and send one out so if I can use kickstarter to pre-sell a number of books then I can get the price down to a point where the people who want it can buy it at so it's not like a thousand dollars a book or something so yeah i just kind of wanted to hack the publishing system because it, it can be hacked yeah so. definitely again thanks again for your time uh paul thank you very much i look forward to uh seeing more of your work um and definitely reading your blog uh and your your newsletter by the way is something i read every every time it comes in man i i gotta thank read it you. so uh, thank you so much for doing what you do. Yeah, no worries. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Bye.